Hi, this is Mr. Conti, and in today's video we're going to be covering concepts from Chapter 12 that deals with global climate. At the beginning of this year we talked about the difference between weather and climate. Weather being short-term descriptions of the atmosphere, whereas climate are long-term descriptions. So you'd like to look at some of the key features or properties that contribute to long-term climate patterns on the Earth. So we'd like to talk first about the possibility that climate can exist on various scales. We've seen this before with something like the global wind patterns. We could talk about little eddies on small scales, the um, Chinook winds, Santa Ana, or the, um, the sea breeze, land breeze phenomenon on, on a uh, middle level scale or meso scale. We could do polar easterlies and westerly winds, trade winds, at a macroscopic scale or jet streams which engulf the entire earth which are global scales and so very similarly here we use those same prefixes to describe different climates microclimates being close to the ground in small zones where surface properties tend to be consistent when we zoom out into mesoclimate areas these are regions like forests towns beaches valleys Zooming out even further, we have microclimates, which in, uh, in count, in, um, encapsulate uh, large states or small nations. And then global climates are patterns that persist over the entire Earth's surface. Some factors that determine climate over the, uh, over the entire surface of the Earth, we have latitude. So many of these factors we've talked about in quite a bit of detail through the course of the year. So why latitude would be a factor in climate control is that year after year, depending on what your latitude is, that's going to determine how much direct energy from the sun you're going to receive and what your length of day will be over the course of the year. So if you're close to the equator in a tropical zone, you're going to experience warmer climates than you would if you were heading towards the poles and that's based on the tilt of the earth and our motion around the sun and that doesn't change year after year so so these are so the fact that around the equator it's warm and near the poles it's cold that's a climate pattern a global climate pattern that is related to latitude your proximity to land or water we've looked at graphs before where you could be at the same latitude but depending on whether you were a coastal city or somewhere in the middle of a country away from any body of water that's going to change the the landscape the amount of precipitation the temperature variations over the course of the year it even matters whether you're on the west coast or the east coast of a land mass and that um, leads into things like ocean currents or prevailing winds with ocean currents you have being on the east coast of the United States you have the Gulf Stream that brings warm up, water up from the south whereas uh, off the coast of California the currents run south along the western coast of the United States and so that brings water down from the north and so the ocean currents can ultimately play a role in either causing the uh, temperature range over the course of the year to be shallow or extreme. The pressure areas when we de determine the global pressure zones low pressure zones remember are located at the equator and 60 degrees north and south and high pressure zones are located 30 degrees north and south and the north and south poles and if you're at a low pressure zone or near it you're going to be experiencing higher amounts of precipitation whereas if you're near high pressure zones then you're going to be experiencing uh, low amounts of precipitation mountain barriers mountains can provide um, a, a barrier between different winds and precipitation so that's your uh, windward versus leeward sides and, and the leeward shadows 
the rain shadows that form on the leeward sides of mountains so that can establish long-term patterns with persistent prevailing winds in place as the winds bring uh, moist air up on the windward side of a mountain it precipitates out and leaves dry warmer air to come down on the leeward side for example and so that the, the um, if you're on the east side of the mountain range you would experience uh, drier air and less precipitation and that's something that could occur for long spans of time. Your altitude also affects your climate. So going up in altitude has much of the same effects as moving up in latitude. So you could be in a tropical like zone like you would be at the equator but if you were so at the base at sea level you would experience what everybody else is experiencing around you but if there was a tall mountain as you climb up the mountain and the temperatures drop according to the lapse rate it's as if you're going up in latitude towards the poles so if it's getting colder then you start you start to get some of the same changes that you would as you would head towards the poles so we'll look at a couple different examples that relate back to that Uh, I'm going to show you guys a an image of these east-west isotherms. You'll see that they bend due to land heating and cooling, ocean currents and upwelling. So if if the surface of the earth was uniform, then you would expect that being in the tropics, you'd have the hotter the hottest weather and it would uniformly decrease in temperature as you go up towards the poles. That's not the case because of the way that land masses absorb and re-radiate heat very quickly and how oceans will absorb very slowly and re-radiate slowly depending on whether you have upwelling or um, sub submersion of, uh, of water currents. That's going to show you that the temperature contrast as you head up towards the poles vary quite a bit. So let's take a look. So you can see, in fact, closest to the equator here, zero latitude, is the zone where we have, on average, the hottest temperatures. So we're not disputing that, but notice that it's not a perfectly symmetrical picture that the lines here have, are very wavy that it's not just a straight band across the equator it the the hot weather dips well below the equator here and that's because of the dry air mass that gets established here in South America and most of Africa if we look as we go into these lighter colors we're getting colder and colder and you see that the colder air dips a little bit further south right off the coast of California and that has to do with this current uh, coming you have this clockwise gyre in the North Pacific here so the current the ocean current is is coming from the north and so it's leading to cooler temperatures southward whereas this clockwise gyre in the North Atlantic is giving us the Gulf Stream which helps to bring these isotherm isotherms further up north and see how this 50 is all the way up here whereas the 50 is the 50 line is all the way down here in this latitude closer to 30 this one's closer to 60 so that's because we're we're moving mass amounts of warm water from the tropics to these regions and so a lot of this now here you can see that it's almost perfectly parallel these there's not really much waviness going on here and that has directly everything to do with the fact that there's hardly any land mass down here so this land mass the land masses have 
a huge impact on temperature variation that that land versus ocean difference the other thing that we need to see and if you want to predict where you're going to get the most moisture you're going to be looking for those global pressure zones so where air is rising that's low pressure you're going to get more precipitation and where air is sinking at high pressure zones you're going to get um, less precipitation it's going to be less abundant so here we have what appears to be the the, the global winds the this is a cross view if you look up at this image this is a cross view of some of the circulation patterns that are going on in uh, in the atmosphere so here we have the trade winds along the surface so they're converging at the intertropical convergence zone and so that that's where you have your global low at the equator and so all seasons are wet all right, because this can shift a little bit to the north in the summer and a little bit to the south in the winter but in general th this tropical zone is always going to get a lot of moisture um, just and because of this the shifting we would expect that as the global winds move towards the north in the summer the zones just outside of the trop uh, the the equator within the tropics get wet summers but dry winters and same the, the same patterns repeated just six months later for those who live in the southern hemisphere where the air sinks that happens around 30 degrees north and south those are your global high pressure zones the tr subtropical high all seasons will be dry at these zones you have uh, around our area dry summers and wet winters around uh, somewhere within our our um, latitude but then we getting we get a uh, the polar front as well so when the polar front dips down south we get a lot of precipitation based on that so we in this zone here we get all our seasons being wet so that's cutting into what where we are as well so I mean we're likely to see precipitation all year round and so that is uh, strongly due to the fact that we're close to the polar front which in the winter will stay up closer to 60 degrees north but dips as uh, far south as what we're seeing now is around Texas and the air sinks once again at the poles where we have that tundra like environment where it's a cold desert so all the seasons are dry so you can see here how pressure and the prevailing wind patterns uh, bring various types of precipitation or the lack of precipitation to certain areas notice with these graphs that we have three cities San Francisco Kansas City and Baltimore which are roughly uh, at the same latitude on the earth but because of their positions in the United States you can see that over the course of the year their average rainfall uh, is drastically different Kansas City has um, for instance their maximum uh, rainfall in the summer and that has to do with those um, those severe storms that they can get uh, with the polar front receding back into into Canada uh, whereas San Francisco is on the west coast very influenced by the cold ocean currents that run south along the Pacific in, within the Pacific and so they have a better chance of getting more precipitation in their winter months when the land is colder than the oceans in Baltimore it 
we we get sort of the best of both both worlds here is uh, we have the the summer uh, patterns that influence Baltimore but we also have the contrast in the as the land as the land cools we have warm water coming up and so our winters tend to be um, tend to be wetter because of the Gulf Stream so you could be in the same latitude and receive drastically different amounts of rainfall depending on your location relative to some body of water. Here's where a mountain barrier becomes an issue. So during this time of year you can see uh, in this map that coming off the Pacific Ocean we have a prevailing wind pattern set up and so this may this seems to have been uh, amplified in the winter and maybe this prevailing wind switches uh, opposite in the in the summer just like a monsoon type of pattern but with all this when the winds come off the ocean that's going to lead to uh, much more precipitation and so you can see a lot of these bars are high especially in the winter months and that is likely due to a prevailing wind right off the ocean where it diminishes this way that's because maybe the uh, change in the wind direction happens with the uh, direct rays of the sun migrating north to south but the interesting thing here is you have another body of water separated by a mountain range and with the prevailing winds coming off from the west here moving west to east that moist water moist air has to pass over that mountain range and as it passes over the moisture condenses out and falls and what you have left over that passes over the mountain range is drier air so by the time you get to this location uh, you you get um, hardly anything or at least very low amounts of precipitation compared to what we have here as a rainforest on the west side of this mountain range so even with that body of water there they still get very little rainfall over the course of the year and that has to do with the mountain barrier in the way and the prevailing wind patterns with our prevailing wind patterns uh, carrying storms from generally west to east you can see we've we've looked at a map like this before where coming off of the Pacific Ocean uh, you you uh, get precipitation to come out on the windward side, drier air on the leeward side. Now if that air passes up onto another mountain range, then you're, you might have acquired a little bit more moisture, but li it's likely that we're just now wringing out whatever uh, rain uh, we seem to have left. But certainly by the time we get to this next mountain range, um, there's just no more moisture left to ring out in the atmosphere and so here we have the rain shadow desert with very minimal rainfall now one way to um, describe various climates is through the use of a climate classification system known as the Köppen system and so this was uh, developed by Waldemir Köppen in back in 1918 and what he used to describe the various climates that we see around around the world both temperature and precipitation so is it hot or cold do you get a lot of moisture or little moisture right, but beyond that uh, he also takes into account the types of vegetation 
that you might be able to grow at certain places. So the vegetation helps for various scientists to understand more about the climate of the area. Some types of plants or trees generally can only thrive in certain types of climates. So for one, a cactus survives in deserts because they're adapted to uh, survive in an environment where there's le very little water. Very similar to uh, evergreen trees. Evergreens uh, exist in zones that they have to survive in cold weather. So, you know, they're being that they're trees, they need a lot of moisture. So, but what but they have to survive not because of uh, little rainfall but because of low temperatures. In our area, uh, we have um, we're in a deciduous forest where we're used to seeing trees that change their colors the, in their leaves before uh, they, they fall down in autumn. That is typical for this latitude, for this type of climate, because of the uh, moist summers that we get and the cooler, drier winters that we um, might receive. So. Um, his his breakdown is pretty straightforward, but uh, over the course of the week, you guys will be filling out a table that you will be allowed to use on your final exam that helps you to organize all of these key features within this system. So here are the key features of the Copen climate classification system. So we can break down the main types of climates into really five uh, key categories. A is equatorial, B is arid, C is warm temperate, D is snow, and E is polar. So if we're talking about an equatorial climate, we're near the equator where it's hot and typically moist B, where it's arid, these are our de desert-like climates that receive little moisture. Those are right around the global high-pressure zones, uh, specifically 30 degrees north and south. Warm temperate climates, so temperate means that it's warm for part of the year, cold for part of the year, so these guys experience all four seasons. Uh, D are places that receive a large amount of snow, so it's cold, but it's also a lot of moisture, so that's going to be up near your 60 degrees north and south latitudes, where you have the other global low. And polar refers to our dry climate, but very cold. So in addition to A, B, C, D, and E, you tag along with it a precipitation abbreviation. So W in this case stands for desert, uh, S stands for step, which we'll talk about, uh, F, lowercase f stands for fully humid, lowercase s stands for summer dry, lowercase w stands for winter dry, so these places experience either dry summers or dry winters, and uh, M stands for monsoonal, places that will receive large amounts of water during their monsoon season will get a designation of lowercase m. And then you want to also denote the temperature with another um, lowercase letter, h for hot and arid, k for cold and arid, lowercase a, hot summers, lowercase b, warm summers, lowercase c, cool summer, lowercase d, extremely continental. So we'll talk about all of these as we go along, but we'll be combining these letters together to create various different climates around the Earth. So in this image, we can see all the different climates, uh, and here 
This red line indicates the intertropical convergence zone in July. So you can see how far north it goes. And so this will show you basically where the, the trade winds collide. And then here we have the intertropical convergence zone in January when the sun has migrated to the uh, Tropic of Capricorn in the south. So quite a bit of variation. You can see this is a huge gap right here over the water. But uh, in using the legend here, you can see that in green, around the equator, you're going to have all that lush green where the you have the tropical environments. Just above that, we have dry in yellow. And so that cuts across this 30 degree north latitude zone for the most part, and 30 degrees south. Now the other part that plays a role here is your proximity to a, a warm ocean current like you do here. So, they, so these guys in South America experience uh, moist, mild winters. Right? That's, be, that's because of this ocean current. Um, you know, in Australia, they can, they can survive pretty well along the coastline, but most of Australia itself is a desert, but they do get some, that interaction between land and water that provides a little bit of a variation in their climate. Uh, for us up here, the, uh, we're getting the Gulf Stream, so that influences our, our uh, climate as well. You can see some of this yellow, though, extending up into Canada, and that is the mountain barrier that we see here. So we have mountains dry, mountains dry. So being in that rain shadow of the mountain range causes the um, the land to be uh, deprived of their moisture content, and you get that here with the Himalayas and so you can see all of the different deserts here on the earth um, and the mountain ranges so the Sahara and the uh, Kalahari we have the Arabian Desert on the Arabian Pen Peninsula Tibetan Plateau is the is uh, around the, the this uh, within the Himalaya mountain range here the Gobi Desert is just beyond the Tibetan Plateau uh, the Turkestan Desert. We have the Sonoran is the one in the United States, and uh, that is we're right along that 30 degree mark, which may, should make sense. So I'm going to go through each of the the climate classes from A through E and show you a couple of uh, the ways that you can combine some of those uh, code. Uh, abbreviations to show you the different types of climates but I'm gonna let you guys do a lot of the work on your own to put together that the table which I'll be posting to canvas for you guys to work on so for group A general characteristics for our tropical moist climates is that you have year-round warm temperatures and abundant rainfall so we're gonna center around the equator and can go north or south about 15 to 25 degrees latitude away from the equator. So the major types is you have the tropical wet uh, climate, so this would be A, capital A, lowercase f, tropical monsoon is AM, and tropical wet and dry would be AW. So we've combined the equatorial climates, which are generally warm and moist, and we are de designating whether they are fully humid, that's just wet all the time, uh, versus monsoonal, which is seasonal, depending on the wind patterns, and then uh, dry winters, that depend, that's usually depends on the 
or, or, or dry summers that depends on the, the migration of the, the intertropical convergence zone. So this map uh, gives you a nice clear uh, cut of what the different climates uh, according to the Köppen classification models are. And in green here you can see all the A climates, but designated here you have AF, which is the fully humid, and that is right along the equator. But you have uh, this, these other various conditions uh, around that zone that are a bit more seasonal, where they get certain dry periods and certain wet periods. So that is highly dependent on um, how close you are to the equator and where you are relative to the land mass as well. This is the type of picture you would see being in a zone that is uh, experiencing lots of moisture and abundant sunshine. They can support lush vegetation like this and all of your rainforests in the world are going to be centered around the equator in those A lowercase f climate zones running through here the right at the equator the um, the temperature ranges only 2.2 degrees or 4 degrees Fahrenheit that's the only variation that they get they're generally around 80 degrees on average all year round but the rainfall totals even though it's a little bit less in July and uh, June, July, and August, that's that's because the intertropical convergence zone has has shifted up north into our area for our summer. This is their winter down here, uh, but they, these guys are closer to the equator, and so they just it's generally always uh, a lot of moisture, but during their winter they get slightly less but it's still it's generally wet all year round now here in Africa uh, this is a common scene in the AW types of climates where you don't have enough moisture to support large trees like you would in a rainforest uh, but certainly grasses can survive on the tight on the amounts of rain that these places get so it is still hot in this in this region and there are seasons where they get more rainfall and uh, that can support uh, a lot of grasses at different times of the year but it's just not enough to support large forests you can get the occasional tree but in general uh, in these grasslands or savannas, which are described as AW climates, uh, these favor more of the tall grasses rather than large trees. So you can see how this plays out on, a, on this map. This is an AW climate zone, and their temperature uh, rises they're they're pretty pretty close to the equator so the temperature variation is still rather small compared to what we experience here it's only 10 degrees from from uh, summer into winter and vice versa still generally warm with an average temperature of 74 degrees year-round uh, but notice the the peak in the amount of precipitation that happens for them in the summer so these guys have dry winters almost nothing in the in the winter months and lots of rainfall when the summer rains come so this is an AW type of climate. Now with the dry climates we're into group B so general characteristics uh, deficient precipitation most of the year so very little rainfall potential evaporation and transpiration exceed precipitation so you can't really support a lot of vegetation here either because whatever moisture that they do get 
they will lose to the environment very quickly. So any types of plant life that exist in these zones have to be able to maintain their moisture um, in a specialized way over the course of the year. We're looking at the global high pressure zones around 30 degrees latitude, so subtropical deserts extend roughly 20 degrees and 30 degrees in large continental regions of mid-latitudes. So slight variations um, depending on exactly how much desert you were talking about here. And mountain ranges are also going to be somewhere we're going to look at these type of dry climates as well. So we have the very mo most arid types of climates are the BW. These are what we t think of as typical deserts. The semi-arid, these are steppes, which uh, do receive some, a little bit more rainfall, but not, not much more. This is a typical scene, even when they do get clouds in these dry areas, these virga, which is what we call these streaks in the air, uh, this is a sign that the atmosphere is very dry here. And so as the rain falls, it evaporates into the air and it never actually touches the ground. So these cacti here are highly specialized to um, collect water and store water over long periods of time. So Phoenix, Phoenix, Arizona is um, placed in the BWH climate zone. It's dry, it's hot, and um, it's it's uh, it in the summer months it it really gets it really gets hot. So there's a huge contrast because in these desert climates uh, when the temperatures fall uh, if there's no cloud cover then you get huge ranges in temperature but so um, we get very high average temperatures in the summer and and this is average this is not even the extremes because um, it can be, you would imagine that temperatures could definitely exceed these values uh, over the course of time, but this is just an average. And then you have very low amounts of rainfall throughout the course of the year. So this is an example of a step where you have a little bit more of a, uh, of, of a chance to get some rainfall and a little bit more vegetation that you can see. So an example of this step or capital B, capital S um, climate zone, again huge temperature contrast, hot summers, uh, cooler winters, unable to keep keep any heat trapped because there's hard, you know minimal cloud cover, but they do get certain times of the year where it, we get a little bit more moisture. So in general, a little bit more moisture than our arid zones. And some, some times of the year, a little bit uh, more precipitation than others. Uh, moving on to the C group. These are moist subtropical mid-latitude climates. So they're generally humid or moist with mild winters. So we're going to Again, get some more temperature variation here. Uh, tends to be, um, depending on where you are, eastern and western regions of, the, of most continents, so near the coast, so these are the marine types of climates, and we're in the mid-latitudes, so somewhere between 25, which is just outside of the tropics, uh, towards 40. So remember 30 is where the subtropical high pressure zone is. That's where you have a lot of dry climates, but you will tend to get these humid groups near bodies of water. So that's where we're going to find them. Now, so C gives us the these moist subtropical mid-latitude climates. F 
stands for fully humid and A stands for the hot summers. Marine is very similar to this humid subtropical but the summers aren't quite as hot and with Mediterranean climates you tend to get uh, cooler summers where the summers are a bit drier. So in Mobile, um, Alabama, we have, this is in the direct, in direct uh, line of sight here from the uh, prevailing winds coming off of the Gulf. So they're just, it's just outside the tropic range, but is generally going to be very moist and uh, we'll have warm summers but generally cooler winters but moist and humid all year round so this would be considered a CFA climate The CFB climate has a bit more of a mild uh, summer, and it's it's a uh, still got quite a bit of moisture with it, but it is generally going to be less than what we see down here with the Gulf. I mean, we're a coastal region in a colder latitude and depending on the prevailing winds which are generally coming out from over Canada it's not going to give us quite the uh, precipitation in the summer but when you have the winds coming off the oceans uh, during the winter months you can even though the temperatures go down you still get lots of precipitation during the winter. So we have San Francisco here and Sacramento here. The, the, the difference in their locations is so small, but look at the, uh, the, the difference in the patterns. The, you, you get this Mediterranean climate, generally uh, more uh, rainfall in the winter, and but the temperature range is what we want to make a note of here. It's uh, closer to the coast. The coastal Mediterranean climate is, uh, the, the contrast is much more subdued, but just a little bit more inland. Uh, the inland coastal climate is has a little bit more temperature variate. So this is a CSB, and this is a CSA where remember C is warm, temperate, that's the zone that we're dealing with right now, temperate in the mid-latitude climates. Um, S meaning that the summers are dry and the difference is whether we're having a more mild summer or a hotter summer. So the inland climate in Sacramento leads to a hotter summer than the coastal uh, climate found in San Francisco. So now we're into the D group climates. So these are moist continental climates, generally uh, warm to, cold, to cool summers and cold winters. Winters are severe with snowstorms, blustery winds, bitter cold. Climate controls um, depend on uh, whether you're on a large continental landmass or a small landmass. So this should sound pretty familiar to us because this is typically the um, where we'll, we would place ourselves. So our area uh, may see uh, some places that would be classified under Group D. Although, if if I were to ask you um, what I think Widener itself would be placed under, 
Um, I lean more towards the C group, uh, very similar to the climate that we see in Mobile. So we, we have this type of temperature contrast with um, a decent amount of precipitation all year. So um, we have cold winters, but uh, they're not quite as brutal as some of the places to the north of us um, by the Great Lakes. So I think we're, we would still be in a, uh, in a zone where it's um, temperate. So that's the C category and um, being so close to uh, the Atlantic and the Gulf Stream, just like the Gulf of Mexico here brings in warm water there, or the Gulf Stream helps to bring in warm water uh, close to us, I would put us uh, more at a uh, CFA climate. But within our region, you don't have to travel far to go into places that uh, experience a lot of moisture, but are further in away from the land masses, uh, away from the oceans, I should say. Um, so you're going to go north of those moist subtropical mid-latitude climates, and you can break them down as uh, the DFA, which is humid continental with hot summers, uh, D FB, which uh, is still humid continental but with cooler summers, and then subpolar, uh, where you're dealing with uh, colder summers. Here we have a park in the uh, Adirondacks in uh, New York. Very typical to see uh, the su uh, an environment that is supports a lot of trees like this, which um, give us the, the, the humid classification, uh, but with a cool summer or a cool winters, uh, we have trees that have learned to drop their leaves when that cold season approaches so that they can conserve their energy. So those broad leaves help to catch light and uh, that's the energy that they need to survive, but uh, it become but it to 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 um, supply those leaves with nutrients to keep them alive takes a lot of energy as well, and so the tree does best in the winter by dropping those uh, cumbersome leaves so that they can conserve their energy and make it through the winter months without much radiation uh, from the sun. So these are deciduous trees because they will change their colors during uh, their leaves during the uh, during the fall and and by the winter they are um, just uh, they've lost all of their leaves. Okay, here we have uh, Des Moines and Winnipeg. So um, the difference here, we have just about the same amount of rainfall. So this would be considered fully humid. So we have the F, um, their mid-continental. Uh, so they're they're inland here. The difference is, I mean, these these uh, trends appear to be similar. So a lot of variation, but you have to look at the scale here. So this is uh, 20, and it peaks closer to 80. This is closer to zero, and peaks around 70. So this one is the hotter summers and um, more mild winters. This one is a, a bit like warm summers, but not quite as warm as this, and uh, colder winters. Now, Fairbanks, Alaska is considered subpolar because we are getting up there in, in latitude. We're up in Alaska, some um, uh, very northern so we get the same types of trends. Um, the this 
uh, big contrast in temperature, much colder temperatures though. So we're down to the uh, negative 10 on average is your high temperatures in the uh, in the winter months, uh, but we can get just above 60 degrees in the summer, and the moisture content, you know, lower but still uh, enough to support some sort of vegetation there, trees. It's going to be a little bit colder so that you're going to start to see the types of vegetation change. So these types of forests are the uh, coniferous forests. They're cone-bearing trees. So um, they have these needle-like leaves, which um, is their way of adapting to the colder climate. So the broad leaves that we see in our area with oak trees and maple, um, they don't exist in these subpolar climates because the, the needle-like leaves that they have uh, do not lose much in the way of moisture uh, and heat as well through transpiration. And so they can they're able to stay green all year round and um, you can happily have uh, huge forests uh, with the type of moisture that they get but the temperatures are what they have to contend with and they're able to because of their um, needle-like leaves rather than the broad leaves in the deciduous forest. So the coniferous forest is uh, has a special name called the taiga, T-A-I-G-A. -A. So uh, these are the, the the colder climates within the the D group, which can support uh, vast amounts of forest, but are subpolar in temperature. The last group was the E group, which is the polar climates. Uh, that is where you're going to have temperatures that are generally very low and you tend to get to be dry because these are getting closer to the poles you get um, the, the global high pressure zones which tend to get minimal amounts of moisture so we're getting very close to the poles with uh, in the um, northern coastal areas of North America, uh, all, all of Eurasia, Af um, the uh, Russia, Greenland, and in the south, Antarctica. So we have two main categories within this um, polar group. ET stands for polar tundra, and so the tundra is essentially the uh, the cold desert, whereas the EP is the stands specifically for the polar ice cap. So the ices that are there are, have been frozen there for uh, thousands and thousands of years, and it on the very minimal amounts of precipitation that they will receive at some time, it, you immediately get um, it freezing and it just creates a new layer but in general those uh, ice caps form over long spans of time rather than sh over short spans of time. It's one of the growing concerns when we see that the the retreats of the ice caps so quickly is because we we know based on much of the data that we have and the research that's been done how long it's taken for those ice caps to ice caps to grow to those immense sizes and for them to diminish in such a short period of time is very concerning for many scientists. So here we have the, um, the cold temperatures that you would expect in a place like this in the northernmost part of Alaska the average temperature is just 10 degrees over the course of the year. But the other fact that leads us to 
see that this is more of a tundra like climate is the low amounts of rainfall so what you get in terms of the types of vegetation are these mosses that can live on very very limited amounts of water and you have the permafrost which is the frozen layer of soil beneath the surface this is the scene within a tundra so no uh, trees of any kind Ve vegetation stays very close to the ground uh, and so you have certain types of flowers and small plants that can survive with these temperatures with minimal amounts of precipitation and this is our ice cap type of climate uh, temperatures are the most uh, are the lowest here uh, with the average temperature at around negative 22 degrees so it can dip as low as negative 50 degrees some of the coldest temperatures that we can experience here on earth with hardly any precipitation at all so when we see these glaciers and um, vast amounts of ice the misconception is out there that there must be a lot of it must be snowing a lot there but this ice has formed over vast amounts of time and it takes a long time to create that little bit at a time it doesn't come from any single season um, this little bit of snow that can you know these 4.3 inches is the annual total and so most of that is it's always below freezing and so it's going to be uh, coming down as snow and so you know at most you're going to get this much of an increase uh, per year but uh, any any solar radiation does help to melt some of the top layers and so what you actually have to grow these glaciers any further is very minimal and now as we're seeing is that with each new new uh, summer uh, we get further melting and uh, and so the in general these glaciers are retreating there is this other group which I'll call H and that we were mentioning earlier as your variation in altitude can lead to um, a difference in climate so because temperatures decrease with altitude you get some of the same types of vegetation growing at different altitudes that you would at different uh, latitudes so great deal of variation in temperature as you go up a mountain you also get variation in precipitation and um, and vegetation over the sh a short vertical change in elevation so you can see down here at the surface it's, uh, it's it, where it could be maybe a little bit drier you have uh, enough to support grasslands the chaparral is the sort of equivalent to a step in in many ways uh, with uh, it's a little it's it's still still dry but um, cooler and now when we have the as we go up we're starting to condense a lot of that moisture out but it's colder so the types of um, trees that we can get growing up at these higher altitudes are going to be closer to your uh, conifer trees but we can start to mix here um, this region where we can get some of the deciduous types of trees into the conifers once we're at these altitudes it's in the taiga where it's purely conifers that can survive at these with these temperatures then you have the tundra like environment which very minimal moisture so we basically rained out as much as we can but it's very cold up here so you'll get these small shrubs and things that stay close to the ground mosses and eventually we get to the ice cap climates that 
we see as uh, the EP types of climates um, closer to the poles. And so you can see that just climbing up in altitude is very close to mimicking moving along at uh, along the surface of the Earth at different latitudes. So there are a lot of different types of climates and so as to not overwhelm you with uh, memorizing all of them that is why I want you guys to work on uh, putting together the uh, the table which uh, allows you to define certain properties and um, you'll submit that next week and I'll take a look at it and return that back to you um, during our last week of class which we come in just to take our uh, final exam and so the questions that will deal with climate on your final are going to be um, they're going to be shorter so there's other parts of this exam uh, and uh, so we won't be able to cover at the end of this year the as much climate related content as we have with other related topics in the course but um, I want you guys to have the uh, the availability of using that chart uh, that you're going to be completing over the course of this week uh, on your final. So if you have any questions throughout the week just let me know and we'll see you next time.